The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the evening of that first day of the week when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to the close of our Novena to St. Peregrine, let us recite together the Novena prayer. O great St. Peregrine, you have been called the Wonder Worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your own flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge, that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction. Help me to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life. Despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious St. Peregrine, aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. Amen. So in today's Gospel, St. John tells us that the disciples were hidden away out of fear. And Jesus came and stood amongst his disciples. He was just there in their midst. No idea of how he got there. He was just there. John says it was the first day of the week. In fact, the word he uses is a cardinal number, not an ordinal number. So as you know, a cardinal number is not one of a sequence. So it's not the first day of the week. It could really be translated day one. So he's making a reference back to the work of creation. And this day one is Sunday, the evening of Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, the day in which the church always lives. It is always day one for us. But then, of course, for us, it's the beginning of a weekly cycle. That always refers back to the original week, the week of creation. So Jesus appears on day one of the week, which is the first day of the week, the first day of the new creation, when light was separated from darkness. He was just there. And then he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, as in the beginning, when the Lord God took the dust and clay of the earth and breathed life into it, forming the features of Adam into his own image. So now, this disparate group, cowering in an upper room in Jerusalem, are formed into the image of Christ, as the second reasoning tells us. They were formed into one body, a new body, a representative body, the body of Christ. So it's chosen, formed, and sent all at the same time by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the way that Christ's presence in the world is now to be realized until he comes again, through this body, through you who are members of that body. Now in ancient Judaism, the days of Pentecost, which were the days of the harvest festival, were linked also with the feast of Passover, the liberation of the people from slavery in Egypt. So two things, the fulfillment of the harvest and liberation. Our harvest is sown on the cross, the seed of Christ which springs up green on Easter Sunday, the new wheat of the Eucharistic bread of Christ. So the 49 days preparation for the 50th day of Pentecost, this harvest feast, also represented the same time as Moses leading the people out of Egypt and their assembly at the foot of the mountain to receive the law. So what was begun in the Exodus was brought to fruition at Sinai. 
So the seed that was sown in the beginning of the Exodus was brought to fruition on the Mount of Sinai. So Pentecost wasn't just an agricultural festival for the Jews, it was a historical festival with a precise date and a precise context. It was a feast of the giving of the law when God married himself to Israel, his bride. But it also celebrates the harvest. Then, So the giving of the law and the reaping of the harvest. Israel's receiving the word of God. Now St. Luke shows us in his account of Pentecost in the first reading that he knew all about these connections. He tells us that they were all together in one house. He doesn't say who they were. They were in a house. Now tradition places this house on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. So Mount Zion, in every pious Jew's mind, was the true pole of the earth, the center of the earth, the place where God dwells amongst his people, in his house, in the temple on Mount Zion. It's the place where God's house is. But in the Easter events, in the Paschal events, we celebrate a seismic shift that takes place. It's the place, then, where the new work of creation continues. The dwelling place of God is not to be on Mount Zion. The new community of his body is to be the place where he makes his dwelling. Wisdom is building itself a new house. The new temple is not built by human hands. It's built of living stones animated by the breath of the Holy Spirit. Now Luke is telling us then that the sealing of this new covenant on Calvary both fulfills and goes beyond the covenant forged with Israel through Moses on the other mountain, the mountain of Sinai. And he tells us that by giving some details which are found in the account in Exodus of the giving of the law. There's parallels. On Pentecost Day, when the Spirit descends, it's early in the morning just like the morning on which Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God before he received the law. And as the people stand at the foot of the mountain, having prayed and fasted for a period beforehand, it's shaken by a great noise that sounds like thunder or a great trumpet blast. It's lit up by the fire of lightning as God discloses his presence on the holy mountain. And the spectacle was so great, according to a first century rabbinical tradition, that the people round about rushed to find out what was taking place. But they couldn't understand being non-Jews and not having shared in the vision. Now the fire and noise of the descent of the Holy Spirit on our Pentecost draws the curiosity and fear of the people of Jerusalem. They rush to see what the fuss is about. So the multitude of devout men, those pilgrims drawn from the Jewish communities of the Diaspora, are amazed and wonder, but they hear the preaching of the gospel in their own tongue. What those who rushed to Sinai could not understand, now these who rush to Mount Zion can understand. Others can't understand it, it makes no sense to them, so they give it their own meaning. The disciples are merely drunk, even though it's between eight and nine in the morning. Now the people of Israel at Sinai were one in mind and heart as they welcomed the law, as the gift of God, just like the Pentecost community in Jerusalem. So Pentecost is the epiphany, the manifestation of the covenant community, the new community of the church, which is born from the side of Christ on Calvary. Now the assembly of the people of Israel at the foot of Sinai was given a special name in the Greek Old Testament. It was called the Ecclesia, which comes into English eventually as church that assembly which is drawn into existence by the splendor of God's word and sustained in existence by inspired obedience to it. Now St. Luke only uses this word in the Acts and never in his Gospel. For him, the church is brought into existence first as it's addressed by the risen Christ and then drawn into obedience by the spirit of Pentecost. Now, God's ten words or commandments of Sinai were meant to undo the original sin of Adam. It's one of God's many attempts then to repair the damage of Eden. So what God wrought on Sinai in the giving of the law, the sharing of his word, 
was an attempt to reconstitute humanity in Adam's shape. The Easter events, the Paschal events, the passion, death and glorification of Christ actually accomplish that. They bring it about. What the first Adam lost, the second Adam not only wonderfully restores, but raises to a new level of existence. So the first covenant on Sinai, the law and the Ten Commandments, presented also a radical challenge to a world founded on injustice, competition, rivalry and greed. And it called the people of Israel to shape their lives to a new imperative, a way of life that incarnated new social, economic and cultural values. Thou shalt not covet a way of life that held together a redeemed community no longer bound in a world severed from God. Now the fulfillment of the new and eternal covenant, the covenant sealed in the blood of Christ, is God's last word, definitive word. And it draws all who share in it into a new form of life, a life which isn't narrowly tied to the present, nor confined in an oppressive nostalgia for the past, but which receives God's future as a gift. We in the church try to live according to the future, the future of our beatitude. Now this gift brings reconciliation, a reconciliation in which diversity and plurality are not expressed in egotistical individualism, but in the charity and harmony of communion. Now St. Luke stresses that each one heard the apostolic preaching in their own tongue. Now when the noise and flames lit up the scene of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, we are told that the people saw the sound. And the rabbis explain this to mean that the noise fanned the air into tongues which gave the one voice of God a plurality of expression which allowed all of those who heard it to understand it in their own language. The law is to be accessible to all. It's to be a free gift. But in Luke, The one fire in many tongues rests on each of the community. The same fire in many tongues. And it prompts them to utter the one gospel in many different ways so that it may be understood. So all of the proud pretension that led to the building of the Tower of Babel and the incomprehension, the mutual incomprehension and hostility which followed on that is undone in this recreative act of the Spirit of God which plants the seed of a universal communion for which we now long and live. So the Pentecost feast is both process and event. It celebrates the harvest which Christ has sown and the Spirit reaps. It celebrates that in the first fruits of the new humanity found in the risen Christ, we too are present in the unity of the Holy Spirit before the throne of God. We live then as if the kingdom has come. But of course we still experience the tension of the already and the not yet. The charm of the pilgrimage sometimes gives way to the strain of the route march. The Jerusalem community was a communion which under the inspiration of the Spirit renounced injustice, rivalry and greed. It had been freed from self-enclosure and self-preoccupation in order to be plunged into communion. So St. Luke's cross church has not renounced the world but is rather the way the world is embraced by the Father, using the two arms of the Son and the Spirit. And the communion he shows us is not an artificial world, it's not an unrealistic world, it's not a purely ideal world. It is the icon of the world, clothed and transfigured by grace. The world as it was meant under God's grace to be, and is that vision for which we live and strive. Let us pray together our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly. And 
that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great faith. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen.